If you enjoy this podcast, don't forget to like and subscribe. Special thank you to Landmark Coffee Roasters, a sponsor for this podcast. If you haven't tasted their coffee, you've got to go check it out. Some of the best beans in Southern California, landmarkroasters.com. Ladies and gentlemen, Nick Reed in the Stoke House. Nick, welcome to the show. Thanks, Josh. Good to be here, man. Nick, you are the lead and founding pastor of City Light Church in Burbank, Los Angeles. Uh, you are married and have four kids. Is that right? Yep, that's right. And from what I can tell, are a diehard Dodger fan. Pretty much. They're like, the like, best team. Yes. Okay. And uh, one thing we have in common is we both planted churches in LA and by the grace of God weathered the storm of the pandemic and are still plowing the ground here in Los Angeles. And uh, yeah, it's it's been a while since we've met. Uh, it's been a long while since we've met, but I was like, I, I love bringing the brothers on the show who are in LA, who have planted and still plowing the ground. So blessed to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you. Appreciate the invite. So uh, we met like, uh, we haven't met, it, it's probably been like seven years or something like that. Yeah, it, it had to be, it's a while. Yeah. Yeah. But um, we met through, was it the SBC that put this on? Is that right? Pretty much. Yep. Are you connected to the SBC? We are now. Yeah. We weren't then. Okay. We are now. Okay. Did you get connected through that, that meeting? Yeah, it was one of the early meetings. Interesting. I don't even think we were officially SBC at that time. Okay. But we orig- then we joined for the purpose of multiplying through Sin Network, which is Shane, which is who we met with there. Is Shane still over it here? Yes, he he's regional now, Western he Regional. Oh wow. And another guy named Will Browning, good guy. He's the he's the guy that kind of took that role that Shane had. Okay. Out here. Yeah, so I can't remember how I got connected, but we show up at like this uh skydiving place. Uh-huh. Outdoor skydiving. Indoor skydiving. Yeah, yeah. It was it's like this tube or whatever. It and was, you, yeah. You got all these pastors yeah. getting thrown up into this tube. <laughs> <laughs> like our first time meeting each other it was yeah, hilarious. Yeah. And then uh, didn't we do some like barbecue or something after? Yeah, it was like a Brazilian steakhouse. I think. Yeah, it was good. It was good. But uh, it was a good, nice point of contact. And what it does is like, I don't know, I felt like it puts everybody on the map and kind of realizes, you know, what young guys, church planners, young pastors, I guess, leading in Los Angeles. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. you. Uh, are you born and raised uh, here in LA? No, born and raised in Vegas. Vegas? Yep. No way. Mm-hmm. Dude, I got a lot of family in Vegas. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was out there a lot for a long time. Yeah. Um, but uh, grew up in Las, Las Vegas, Nevada. And um, did you grow up in the church? Uh, are your parents Christians? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they are. Um, not together. They aren't together. Uh, but we were raised in a small little SBC church in Vegas, real mm-hmm. small church, mm-hmm. probably 70, 80 people. And um, primarily um, raised by my mom. There's, I'm, I'm the youngest of four boys. Okay. And so primarily raised by her. My dad had some struggles um, with addiction during uh, most of our life. When I was 11, he he disappeared. And, um, mm. and so that was kind of when my mom was it. And so she raised us. And my dad didn't show back up again until my sophomore year in college. Mm. So like 11 to mm-hmm. 20. And... Um, yeah, he he. We we didn't know. We thought he. We didn't think he was alive, mm. and uh, he just went through a really hard time, and then ended up. Long story short, um, finding himself in a really tough situation, and and really coming to the Lord officially. Wow! And giving his life, and and that really began his sobriety, and he ended up getting remarried, Praise and God. um, yeah, he's he now is very heavily a part of a church in Vegas that really? he leads a celebrate recovery program. He's nice. the leader of it. And, awesome. So it's a pretty incredible story, but yeah, we, my mom primarily raised us in the church, small church. Yep. Got it. And, uh, did you grow up private school, public school? No, she, uh, she had a pretty strong conviction of homeschooling. Homeschool. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was you, but yeah. So we did that, but we played a lot of sports Okay. and that was like before you could actually be homeschooled and play public school sports. Ah. And so like, we'd go to like the school board meetings in Vegas, nice. county school district and be like, let us play. To where they weren't letting us, so we ended up doing like a charter school program okay. in high school and yep. playing sports at a high school there. Got it. Played a lot of baseball. Got it. And um, yeah, but homeschooled primarily and just did church. What uh, what position you play? Middle infield. Okay. Stop second base. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you play into college? No. The college, when it came time to go uh, to school, it was the school I ended up going to didn't have a baseball team. Got it. Um, so that was on the radar. Yeah. But that was kind of the time where I felt God might be leading me to ministry. Yes. And so it was kind of like during that whole 
section of my life. Got it. So you grew up homeschooled all of your life? Yeah, pretty much. And then in high school, I did that charter program. I was going one day a week. It's like co-op? Pretty much, yeah. They have them in Vegas now big. And you go in one day a week with your teacher, and then you're given your work to bring home. And you do your work, and then you come in and you get your grades. You play sports the high school you're zoned for. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah, so I'm public school system, but my wife was homeschooled her whole life. Okay. And her sisters. Yeah. Uh, so, there, so her mom was just like, we're doing this, you know? Yeah. And uh, yeah, her mom was, uh, as a master's in education, was just excited about getting after it. And uh, I love it. Yeah. We're, we're homeschooling uh, my Eden now, my oldest okay. girl. Yeah. Nice. And we'll probably end up homeschooling the boys as well. Yeah. And, um, but homeschooled in Vegas. Yeah. Is that, what was that experience like? Nobody did it back then. Yeah. I mean, that was like nobody. She like, my oldest brother was born in 78. Okay. And so she homeschooled him. Yeah. And that was like, probably was one of the fewest. I mean, she did homeschool and she did home birth. Right. Wow. Which, which were crazy. Whoa. She was ahead of the time. Yeah. And like, <laughs> no <laughs> like vaccination. Yours. Wow. And uh, yeah, it was crazy, dude. So that was her, that was, that was our life. But yeah, she um, homeschooled in, um, in Vegas and the oldest brother down did it, man. No one did it that time. Yeah, I'm saying that's, I mean, it's again in Las Vegas to do that of all places. You know, you, yeah, you're not going to find very many people doing that. Praise no. God for your mom. Yeah. Making that happen. So it was a good experience then overall. It was. Yeah, it was good. It was good. I mean, it was, we begged her to go to school sometimes, yeah. but yeah, she yeah. was pretty convictional. Yeah, yeah. Like I know God told me. Wow. To do it. And like, and she can tell you for sure. And so she drew her line in the sand and she wasn't giving in. Wow. Um, And yeah, she, even though, I mean, I remember when my dad was, going through some struggles and then when he disappeared mm -hmm. um i mean she cleaned houses mm -hmm. and we had a landscape lawn maintenance business mm. uh, and that we took over as the boys mm. and was we mowed all the yards in our neighborhood and no in way the city. you and guys are running it we ran it yeah so uh my oldest brother worked for did that and he going to caesar's palace and doing that um so yeah just landscaping mom cleaned she'd bring us to the table of the houses she cleaned wow she'd be like do your schoolwork and that was that was so ingrained in our head because that was like part of just what we did. We mm. went to the table, she cleaned houses, and then <laughs> we we did our work. So, man, you guys are you guys are doing business as kids. We did, yeah. Which is a unique experience, and only given probably because you were homeschooled. For sure, we couldn't have done it. We were required. My dad was doing it. We were. I was required to do one day a week, mm. and we all there's four of us, so we'd each do one day a week. We would get paid like a quarter a yard. Yeah, like that blow like four years old out there, five years old, blowing this thing off, and Dude, I love it. it. And then uh, when he disappeared, my brothers, had, uh, two oldest brothers had to get their GEDs and then they had to go up and take over all of his accounts Got it. because it was like, you know, we had no clue where it was. Yeah. And so, yeah, they, they ran it from there, changed the name of the business. Mm. And then we just all four did it. And that's how we survived, man. But I love this. I mean, it was, it was like you had to do it to survive. Yeah. But that instilled so many principles in you oh, as a young sure. person. Yeah, definitely. Right? Oh, dude. Yeah. I mean, management and dealing with people, customer service. Yeah money. Yeah. I mean, all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. For no, sure. No, I mean, I'm, I'm saying this because this is one of my passions for homeschooling our kids is because I did the public school system and it was just a, a social experiment for me. I just went there and goofed off with my buddies, you know, and played sports and yeah. like, you know, who knows what I learned? I don't know. You know, like I still to this day, like like I can pinpoint, you know, certain classes I liked and all of that, but I don't know the development process over time. When I stepped into the real world, I didn't know finance. Yeah. I didn't know business. I don't know management. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, we learned a bunch of, we learned how to work hard and we learned uh, a bunch of stuff about the house because of my grandma. Yeah. Uh, who was a farmer from Oklahoma. So she made us work a uh. lot in the backyard. Uh. But had I not had that, I mean, I would have... Um, I don't know. I would be even 10 times sloppier, I guess, because I was a pretty sloppy <laughs> kid as a 20 year old. And like, it took a lot of older, wise, yeah. successful men uh, in the church to basically, you know, hone, hone these gifts and abilities. And so I don't know. I love that, man. I love yeah. that. You, you know, you guys were forced into it, but I'm like, I want to force my kids into it, but I want them, I want them to learn finance young. I want to yeah. learn l work and management. If I can build little entrepreneurs when they're yeah. young, I mean, dude, they, I don't care what they do. Yeah. Do whatever you want. Just do it well. Yeah, you for know, sure. Build, you know, like create. So uh, that's really cool. You had that opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you guys, uh, what uh, you, what denomination you guys grow up in? You said Southern you said Baptist. SB, SBC? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was a small church. My uh, small church. It was a good church. It was a family church. Yeah. 
and uh, our pastor. Like how was, big? Yeah, like 30 seven, people? 100, 100 maybe people? maybe 70 on a good day. Oh, I love what it. What I remember. Yeah. Hymns only. It's the best. Suits, ties. Nice. Um, our, our our pastor, when I was probably about 10 or 11, it was kind of a, a really crazy time to think about. But during the time my dad disappeared permanently mm-hmm. and came back later on, my our pastor uh, got in a wrong relationship mm. um, with a lady in the church. Mm. And um, and then his all he lost his family. And I remember being in the service where he resigned and told the church Whoa. with the lady. And that was when my dad was disappearing. So we lost like two big roles in my life, my father, which I was close with, and my our pastor. And in that time... Uh, the moder the the kind of the head deacon guy, I guess you could say, became the moderator. Mm-hmm. She's a really good friend of ours, and he's struggling out some some dementia and old timers, but um, mm-hmm. just very good, faithful dude guy and his wife and family, and uh, we just we just kind of did it. My mom led the youth ministry. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was all new to us. I mean, we were all kind of a first generation of Christians, mm-hmm. you know, in, in our home. Um, Where'd your mom get saved? So my mom. Uh, crazy story. She was at a marriage encounter seminar. I think you call him. My dad was from the story I'm told, mm-hmm. um, was in the, was, was, was in the bar downstairs getting drunk. Mm. She was up in the room, opened the drawer and p- pulled out a Gideon's Bible. Mm. First time she, she was raised Catholic, but like Christmas and Easter only. Wow. Opened to John three sixteen. Wow. Like, this is her story to me. She says it all the time. For God sold the world, gave his only begotten son. You know, she, 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 she believes she got saved there. She bowed down and said, God, this is true. I want it. And she took that Bible with her and she went to the Catholic church that Sunday, next Sunday, and they didn't open their Bible. And so she used to run down uh, 5700 Vegas Drive Boulevard, which is where the church I grew up at. They lived at a house down there in that area. She would jog, she was in a running, mm. and she would she would run down the sidewalk and jump up and hit a little mul- uh, mulberry tree. They would hang over the sidewalk and hit it with her hand. Mm. So she remembers like, I wanna go ask them what happened to me because I feel so different since that hotel room. Mm. And I just wanna know what happened to me because I, I have the Bible. So she went there, and at that time, not the pastor we grew up with, but another pastor was there, and she met with him um, or it could have been the guy we grew up with. One of them, she met with him mm-hmm. and went to his office and was like, hey, what happened? He's like, well, I think he got born again. Mm. And he's like, let's make sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then she got baptized there. Wow, and then God. Yeah, and then my oldest brother was three and two. Young, the next one was two. And my dad never really did. He may say he got saved, but truly did not really get saved, I don't think, till you know, later on in life. Mm. Um, and then she was kind of the split home of her trying to raise us boys. And then my dad kind of playing the game of church now and then, but, but addiction on the side and then, you know, eventually just leaving all together. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. How do you think this, um, this stuff has shaped you? You know, it's like sometimes the, the difficult things that we have to work through in life end up like, it's kind of weird because it's almost, you know, if you don't go through it, you don't, you don't become that yeah. type of person. It's, it's almost like, you know, the kids who grow up with a golden spoon in their mouth, you know, they they miss a lot of cues. Yeah. And um, and sometimes the, the, the cues of scrappiness and kind of being able to work things out in life and, and overcome and work through anything. But sadly, sometimes the child that has to go through a lot of turmoil and tragedy and ends up building grit yeah. and tenacity and focus and drive. Um, and you don't wish it upon any kid because yeah. you don't want them to have to go through that. Yeah. You know, we want the best for our kids. We don't have to have yeah. to go through difficulty. But, you know, your dad um, bailing at 11 and then the pastor kind of bailing on the church. Mm. Yeah, How did that shape you? Any any reflection on that? Yeah, it was hard, dude. Um, I think it shaped us to realize, like, one, it was not like... It shaped us to have a real walk with God because I didn't get saved until I was 13. Mm. And so it wasn't until June 30th, 1999, where I trusted Christ. Mm. But as a thir- as 11 year old, that was still sought real to my mom. It wasn't a game. Mm. It was like our life. It was church Sunday morning, Sunday night, mm-hmm. Monday night visitation. Kids got put and got watched by the adults while they- everyone went out and visited. Mm. Wednesday night prayer meeting, Thursday night teen Bible study, Saturday morning door to door soul winning. Whoa. And so that was like, oh, it was like, it was not the deal. So that was like what I thought Christianity was for everyone. Wow. And it was like, you know, uh, so many nights here, our mom pray in her room, um, like meals, no meals. We grew up on like pancakes for dinner, like no meals, no food. God, we got to pray. Power bill going to get, t- lights going to get turned off. Wow. Let's pray. So we saw God save our, turn up, leave our power on. Groceries get delivered when we had nothing. Yeah. So many times that it, tra- it taught us like God is real. Like yes. this is, this is it. It's not like a game. It yes. was, a, that's all we knew. 
which is really hard for me later on when I came to ministry to realize that's not the case for a lot of people that call themselves mm-hmm. Christians. Mm-hmm. And um, But for us, it was really much real. So it caught, taught us, I think, to be dependent on God, not man. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, so many great things about calling in my, my life and even people's over-dependence on denominations and networks mm. and the need for man's approval and man's mm. acceptance mm. is huge, but we just didn't have that. It was right. like, we're gonna, we have God's acceptance. Who else do we need? Yes. Um, and it sounds so cliche to say now, like we're just trying to prove a point, but it was like, that was the truth mm-hmm. of like what we experienced. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah, you know, I was talking to my brother about this and I, I was tell Jess, I'm like, you know, I don't, my dad was the worship leader at Pentecostal church uh, Okay, at 30 people. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like nice, small, little tight, you know, community. And, um, I remember telling Jess, I'm like, I don't think dad like ever witnessed to us one time. <laughs> like, I don't remember him ever like sh- outlining the gospel or like, you know, he, he just, it was just very natural form of his life. It's yeah. just, he's just always known God and he's always worshiped the Lord and it, it, it was a given in our home. Like we know the Lord, we walk with the Lord, we go to church, we give to the church, yeah. even if we don't have any money. Yeah. My dad's given us a quarter to go drop in the thing. I mean, yeah. I know he can't pay his rent. Yeah. I know we, we, we were losing places. We're losing the car. We're, you know, we're, we lost our mom when I was six. And so mm. we, we went through a lot growing up. We were trailer park kids, you know? Mm. So it's like, we, we, um, we didn't have a lot, but my dad, uh, I didn't know we didn't have a lot. And I didn't know we were in such terrible times, I guess. Yeah. It's not until now when I look back on all the crazy, it was like my dad just kept worshiping and just kept singing through it all. And um, it was the testimony of his life that won us to Christ. You yeah. Know? It, was, it was the gospel shouting through his life that yeah. uh, the Lord is real. We, we just pray to him to pay the bills. We pray to him. We just go to him for everything. And that's how it's going to work out. So what a loud testimony of your mom, dude. Just, yeah. Just, um, just plowing through, yeah. staying close to the Lord, keep walking with the Lord, keep shining the light, despite all the ups and downs, mm-hmm. despite all the cra- imperfections and all the things, you know, it's like the Lord's the constant yeah, <laughs> and it's paying on dividends this day. Praise God. Right, for sure. Unreal. Yeah. What God has done through your mom in your life now in LA, yeah. now a lot of people's lives. Yeah. Unreal. It is. So um, you said you got saved at 13 and you're playing baseball in high school mm-hmm. and um you know, you got the gift of gab. I can already tell, like, you can talk to people. Where did this, like, d- did you notice this as a young kid? You know, did you did you notice this in high school? Like, huh, people maybe listen to me, you know, yeah. or like, uh, like what, how did I develop this talking? Is it, yeah. was it through business or as a kid or what yeah. do you think? I don't know, man. That's a good question. I mean, I don't know. I'm not sure. I never even thought about it, probably. I mean, we we definitely were in it. We, we, we were... We were not the typical homeschoolers that kind of get a bad rep. Sure. Um, we, we were involved yeah. with sports yeah. and church. Yeah. That was it. And so we would interact with people that were unbelievers and thought differently and looked differently and voted yeah. differently and right. whatever differently. Yeah, yeah. We just learned to interact. And she and that was, I think, what saved us. I see. And um, learning to talk and communicate. But um, I did have chances to, like, to speak and preach, like, even before I trusted Christ, mm-hmm. I remember preaching my first sermon wow. in Vegas. Really? Uh, yeah, on the west side of Vegas. During, so when the Rodney King stuff went down here, there was a lot of uh, shopping centers getting burned and stuff in Vegas mm. during the riots. And our church had a lot of uh, black people in it. Yeah. Our, our leader of that church did a prison ministry. Awesome. And a lot of ladies in that prison ministry, they got saved. Okay. And their families would come. And they'd be of other nationalities. A lot sure. of them would be black ladies yeah. and black guys. Yeah would come. And so we went down to that West side of Vegas. And I remember preaching my first sermon as like a 10, 11 year old down there in front of these burned buildings, giving out hot dogs to like a bunch nice. of people that like aren't, look, don't look like me. Sure. So yeah, we had chances to preach like even before I was saved. So you guys would do a barbecue, give out hot dogs, rally the people. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, everybody would show up. Yeah. And then you would, the, the 10, 11 year old starts preaching. Preach. Yeah. You just preach what you heard on Sunday. Like, you remember what you preached? Probably not. Probably you need to get saved. <laughs> you need to get saved. Burn in hell. That's it. Yeah. Saved. Okay. Who knows? That probably, works. I have no clue what I said. Yeah. 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 But you but, were doing ministry before you were officially saved. I was. I was. Very much so. Praise God. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And then. Uh, 13, um, were you, your mom was over the youth, youth US, department, yeah. right? She's doing youth mm-hmm. ministry. So were you in, greatly involved in that at 13? We were, we were, high school? I was, yeah. Um, 
My older brothers were more so. I was though. Yeah. I kind of went through some struggles, no doubt. Yeah. Um, with playing games, but I still went. Yeah. But I was involved. Um, but you know, Darren, my oldest brother taught sometimes, and okay. it's hard to hear your older brother teach. Got it. Um, yeah, oh, for sure. That relationship struggle. Um, <laughs> he tried to be dad when dad wasn't around. I see. Which was all through my eleven to college. I see. So yeah, I mean, we got involved though. We were there. What number are you? I'm the youngest. You're the youngest. Mm -hmm. of three boys. Four boys. Four. Mm -hmm. Wow. No. Yeah, I'm the oldest of three. Oh wow. I'm the older brother. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Nick. <laughs> no, that goes. No, but as soon as you said that, I can't help but like, <laughs> uh, like am I trying to be dad? You know, like. Yeah. And I kind of was, I think, to my brother sometimes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um. So, um, you said stepped into college. Mm -hmm. Um. And uh, you did college in Vegas? No, I went to college in a place called Lancaster, mm. California. Palm really? Hill area. Oh, yeah, yeah, of small, course. A small local church, oh. Bible college. Yep. Um, How'd you get connected there? You know what? It's so funny. Because we were raised at Southern Baptist Church. Yep. No youth pastor, though. No no, no pastor through most of my teen years. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was a church in Vegas that would take us to a youth conference that was at, a that was at the church in Lancaster, California. Okay. And the church in Vegas was a more of a, a, you know, your listeners might know, independent fundamental Baptist sure. type stripe. Okay. And so suit wearers, really conservative, King James Bible only, wow. very hyper oh, yeah. fundamental. Got and it. so they would take us to this conference and we would hear and, and you know, it was, a, it was the most organized Bible doctrine, Bible studies being taught because mm -hmm. we weren't really brought up in a strong, you know, Bible expositional church, sure. teaching church. Okay. But so we were like, wow, this is amazing. And there was a big church. It was on fire. It was growing. Yep. So I went to that one. I was 13, 14 maybe. And then when it came time to play, to go to school outside of uh, high school, I saw a lot of the kids I played public school baseball with end up getting in trouble in the college. Mm -hmm. I had some opportunities to play in some colleges, but... I was like, okay, my, my brother right above me was at the Bible college in Lancaster mm -hmm. and he was feeling like God was calling him to ministry and he was mm -hmm. more active in our church okay. preaching. Got it. And he was, he now pastors in Vegas. Wow. And so he was way more active than me though. So when he went, I remember talking to him and I was playing public school baseball. He always wanted to, mm. but he, he was homeschooled and could not play. I did the charter school program. I'm the youngest. So I was playing public school sports. I had opportunities p potentially to go to play college, but I knew that I didn't want to mess my life up because I saw what what addiction and things got my my dad into. Sure. And our mom taught us to be grounded in scripture. And um, we had some extended family that were LDS. And in and my mind, I was like, if LDS can give a few years of their life, like all this could be like one year of my life sure. to a Bible college. Sure. And so it sounded really good at the time. And that was my reason. Mm -hmm. And I went and I showed up to this really conservative because I was brought to conferences there. Um, I did not know about any Southern Baptist colleges or even yeah. Christian colleges yeah. at that time. Homeschooled, not really part of the public school system. So I didn't even know about college outside of that. I just knew this place taught the Bible and they had a college. Showed up there with my NIV Bible and uh, and I got called into the dean's office like, yo, we have one Bible here, King James Bible. And and then like I'm like learning like all this stuff, like what world did I step into? Oh, and, like, I love it. Go to like get pizza with these guys at the school and it has like a Budweiser sign on the window and they're like, Hey, we can't we we can't we can't go there. They just sell beer, and I'm like, oh, where do we go then? You're like, I just uh, I just came from Vegas, man. <laughs> no, dude, where do we go? Yeah, <laughs> which pizza joint? Oh, dude, I don't even know what it was called. It was a little place in Lancaster. And so, anyways, that one year ago, pizza and beer. Oh, probably pizza and beer. I mean, it probably was. Uh, I, I did not know the world I stepped into. These kids were all like preacher boys, raised in college churches, mm -hmm. like like the college, fundamental independent Baptist churches. I mean, these kids like had their Bible memorized. And I'm like, this dude is like, dude, I don't even know why I'm here. I just know. I was like, I, th I thought I was just giving one year of my life. Fast forward short, they have a bus ministry at that church. So you have to be involved in the ministry and you have to be involved in the church. It's a local okay. church seminary, about yep. seven, 800 students. Yep. And, wow. um, and you have to be involved in the ministry though. And the church is probably four or 5,000. Wow. And so very active church in Lancaster. So the, they had a bus ministry, never heard of a bus ministry. They probably run like 20 to 30 buses into inner city primarily. Uh, kids that ride the buses are black primarily sure. and maybe a few other different minorities. Yep. But um, so I, I ended up getting on a bus route and that changed my life because wow. I preached my first sermon officially in college on that bus route. On the, mm. on the ride home, you have like 70 kids on this bus. Mm -hmm. You bring them there after church to like come to a Bible study uh, or Sunday school thing, whatever, on Sunday afternoon. Okay. On the way back, you preach a sermon, you lead songs. And so I'm leading songs, like weird songs, like, you know, we are the back of the bus, we're the front of the bus, like songs I never heard before. Wow. Like kid songs. Right. We didn't do that stuff in my church. Right. 
And then I preach a sermon. I see kids get saved and like that, like transform it. Cause I'm like, holy cow, like God, someone, God saved someone cause I preached a sermon. And I remember these kids, I still remember their names. Kids that got saved and come into the conference, to the call, to the different services of the college. They did youth conferences and different stuff, bringing these kids in, starting paying for them to come. Mm. And then like into my freshman year, like I have no clue what I learned that year, other than the fact that I was on a bus ministry. I ended up getting offered to be the bus captain my sophomore year. And nice. So I was like, a one year is done. I'm it. It's done. I go back home to Vegas. Start. My dad comes back in my life just at that time. He's doing landscaping still. So start working with him in the summer, like okay. shoveling rock and landscaping yards. Yep. And then I'm like, I'm thinking I'm going to stay there. But I get called from like the bus director and like, hey, we're going to give you a bus route. That bus route, bus 16 is going to be yours. And so I'm like, holy cow, I got to go back now. So back my sophomore year, became a bus captain, ended up seeing this bus route grow from like a handful of kids to hundreds of kids. And to where like, I remember like a big day, we were praying for 250 kids to come on our bus route. Mm. They gave us two buses and we prayed and prayed and prayed and fasted and prayed and bade God. And we saw 254 kids come. Crazy. And I was like, first time I was like, dude, like God heard me. And, and wow. it was just God was shaping me. Yeah. So after my sophomore year, I was in. Junior year, I got to come back and do bus route again. There's too many of these kids that gotten saved. I met my wife my junior year. Wow. At like, she traveled tour groups for the college. Wow. So, Are you 20, 21? By 21. Yeah, yeah. She played the piano. Okay. And uh, she was really active in the music t teams there. Mm -hmm. Met her. At that time, I'm like, I'm like kind of more into the college now because I did the bus route. I got invited to like preach on like a Barnabas team that encourages churches in Southern California. Mm. And I was traveling with them. You know, slowly kind of getting involved, kind of living in the paradigm of the college world, mm -hmm. especially a big church, you yep. know, and then um, met her fast forward, you know, we get married our, my senior year. She graduated a year older. And so she's done. We get married my senior year, still did the bus together. Wow. And then we graduate, I graduate in 2004. We get married in 2000. Uh, no, I graduated in 2008. Okay. Went to school in 2004. We got married in 2007. Okay. And so we lived our, my senior year off campus. Fun. And uh, yeah, and from there we got out of school. And now, you know, I'm like fully ingrained in this independent fundamental Baptist world mm -hmm. because that's the thing that's like where God worked in my life at this college. Sure. I wasn't raised in that. Got it. So, yeah. Wow. So you, you yeah, really cut your teeth in, in ministry and in preaching and in people. Yeah. Um, there at the college, and yeah, man, what what church is this, dude? So, so it's called so it's called Lancaster Baptist Church. Yeah, yeah. And the college is West Coast Baptist College. Okay, great people. Yeah, and so some of my friends. Who's the pastor there? Paul Chapel. Okay, yeah, Paul Chapel. Yeah, and the uh, okay, wow. I mean, amazing, dude. That like this kind of stuff is. Ha I mean, the way you built out the whole system of this thing, and it's like I can see it all working, and how yeah. they've like. I mean, just really amazing vision that they've done up there out in the uh, the desert. Yeah, Animal Valley, man, middle of nowhere. Yes. 40th Street East. No, I love Nothing it. out there. Wow. But there's a church. A church. And there's a body of believers worshiping God. There's. A lot of people getting saved mm -hmm. and trained up and then sent out. Yep. Wow. Um, are you still connected to a lot of the brothers? Unfortunately not. Um, a couple of them, but it's really a, a group that if you don't do things their way, Got it. Like pulpit attire is huge. Sure. King James Bible is never changing. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about this. Yes. So no, I want to I want to hear this. So this <laughs> is fun. So um so you transition out of college. Yeah. And are you transitioning out? Are you like King James only, like time, suit, suit and tie? Like you're oh, bro, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, no contemporary music. Yeah. So did you did you jump right into a church or what'd yeah. you end up doing? My brother pastored in Cortez, Colorado. Okay. Went and worked with him. Yeah. And I was sold on. You were suit and tie and, and, oh, everything. and, and King James. Well, dresses. You don't wear pants. No girls wow, wear pants. Wow. And then wh where was he at? He was in, he was in, he went to school, graduate, that same school, became a, a pastor in a town called Color, Cortez, Colorado, kind of by the Four Corners. Okay. So you guys were both suits. You're good. Suits, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I led choir, oh. worship, like uh, the choir and the nice. hymns only. Nice. Children's ministry bus route. I'm not throwing water on no, this. It, I love the foundation. Oh, bro. It's like crazy. Like you can't even think this stuff exists. Yes. And I, I didn't even want to bring it up. But yeah, it is. It's a crazy world. But I did that. I was there for him about a year and a half. Okay. The year and a half with your brother. Uh -huh. And then? Went to, uh, from then I uh, was going to come back and work for the college. Um, and they- and, and Your professor? Took, no, I was going to 
do like a traveling evangelist. Okay. To, brought a tour group one summer all yeah. down the Pacific, all down the West wow. from here to Washington to um, the whole thing. And I saw a lot of churches, 80 churches in two, two and a half months. Whoa. And so a lot of church and a lot of churches, they're like, wow, these are dead places, some good places, but struggling, discouraged pastors. So you go in and do some evangelism. For yeah. Them. You bring in a, a singing group, you yeah. preach, hold a youth meeting, just go there Sunday, mm-hmm. try to encourage them, canvas doors. And then um, did that one summer. My wife found Is out. Just like was, Southern gospel. Uh, a little more conservative. Yeah. No beat. Okay. No beat. No beat. Just voices. Voices and piano. Oh, I love it. Yeah. And, and the four parts of, you know. My dad loves this stuff. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, he's, he loves this. Uh, this is it, man. It's, yeah. So my wife found out she was pregnant though that summer. And so I was like, well, I can't travel and drive a 15 passenger van on like windy roads on the West Coast. Yes. With a wife that's going through morning sickness. Yeah. And we were married a couple, a year, year, two years by that time. So that's when I, he said, the pastor there at, Lancaster said, Hey, I know of a guy in Arkansas that is an, uh, that looking that's growing a church and he, he might be interested in you coming there. So I called him, me and my wife went out there in 2009 and, uh, another, another little, another church that was independent fundamental Baptist, good guy, good people, small town, 10,000 people, Independence County. I mean, just, uh, great Christians. And, um, but yeah, dude, we went there and I did choir, bus ministry, children's youth, Whoa. assistant, whatever your assistant could be, he mowed the grass. We were there wow. for three and a half years. We had our first two daughters at, um, the little hospital there off the white river. Amazing. In Independence County. So from Vegas to Lancaster to Colorado, back to Lancaster to Arkansas. Yep. Yep. <sighs> Yeah. yeah. And so I uh, got it three years there. The uh, landscaping came, business came in handy. Sure. Yeah. You're mowing the lawn, you're doing all this stuff. Yeah, the yeah. pastor loves you. Yeah. And what happens? I When I went there, I told him, hey, great guy. I said, hey, I'll be here three years. And then me and my wife feel very strongly. We felt like in Colorado, God confirmed he wanted us to pastor. Wow. And we feel very strongly want to plant. How did you, Coast. how did that, what happened? I was working with youth ministry in Colorado yeah. and I would love to work with youth, but I found in our ministry that a lot of the kids that were reaching did not have saved parents. Okay. And so we were losing the kids because the parents, it wasn't real at home. Mm. And so I felt like, okay, we got to reach the parents. Mm. And I know you can do this as a youth pastor, sure. but I just felt like I, I knew, felt like God was leading me to be the lead pastor. We heard a lot about church planting yeah. at the college we went to. Yeah. And um, I said, okay, God, I want to start something. Mm. And I, I went back to my years of traveling for the college. I realized the struggle, like in our world, it's, and not meaning this offensively, but in our world, it's in the world I was in, it's like, it's easier to give birth to a baby than to revive the dead. Mm. And so that was like, what would be said? And obviously the context there is some of these churches yeah, are yeah. kind of like dead totally. and it's easier to just to start something. Yeah. And so I just like, you know, I don't want to go in and deal with you know, somebody's sacred cow sure. that they have in their church since for, you know, for 20, 50 years. Yep. So I want to start something. And yep. so we told that pastor in Arkansas, we want to go back to the West. We were thinking Seattle mm-hmm. and, or or all the way down to California. Mm-hmm. My wife was born in Whittier. Okay. So she talked about, oh, we went to school in Lancaster, which is an hour North of here. Sure. So we knew LA was needy. Yeah. And so he said three years. Okay. And so he ordained me there. Wow. And three years came up. We had two kids and three and a half years, really. And then he sent, he was our sending church and we came out here and that's kind of the world we stepped away. That was when we stepped out, officially stepped away from the IFB world because we were kind of now doing this thing that we felt God was leading us to do. Mm. So we. So um, you, you guys just moved straight to Burbank and you're like, you know, what'd you do? You throw a dart at a map and see where it land or what? Uh, Yeah. It's a great, yeah. So we, so originally we were going to go start a church in Fullerton mm-hmm. and we were in, in that world, you book meetings, yep. you, there's no network, there's sure. no funds, there's no mega church that supports you. Right. About every church usually gives you about 50 to 75 bucks a month. And so we booked, we sent out about 800 brochures in Arkansas. And then we booked meetings and called pastors and said, Hey, we're going to be on the road. Wow. We bought a new Toyota Sienna minivan Wow. and sold our house, put everything in storage. And we have a photo of our two kids, our young, our, our second daughter is in a car seat in front of the house. And we said, bye. And we kind of hit the road and we started traveling. So we, ra- we, we visited these churches for months and raised support and you figure out, okay, if I need seven, $8,000 a month to live on sure, uh, to support, not just your family, but the church, sure. everything, then let's do this. We have a sending church. So there's no network, no denomination, nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, so that, so we got on the road. We were gonna come to Fullerton. We Ridge Point Baptist Church was the name. We incorporated, got a rein, everything. 
Long story short is there was a group of people that were started out of that college Mm -hmm. um, out here in Burbank that um, did not have a leader. Mm. And they, uh, a lot went on um, and we were, we came and met with them and Mm -hmm. we just said, okay, we know we were going to go full or 10, but let's call our supporting churches and figure out. We do feel like God may be leading us here, even though Orange County is a lot newer and more whiter Mm -hmm. and more like what I was used to. Sure. Then the oldness of Burbank is still looked at new here, but still got the LA feel. Right. Um, And it's, you know, we, but we, we called our churches and not every church that was supported us that we will support you guys. We're with you guys. Um, So we went, so we just started, man. And we, that's when we began in um, November of 2012. That's when we began out here in Burbank. Wow. Yep. November 2012. Yep. So you've been here almost 12 years. Almost 12 years. 12 years this year. Yep. Amazing, man. Congratulations. Thank you. Incredible feat. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's not said lightly, you know, coming from a church planner in LA. Yeah. This is a rough city. Yeah. And hard, hard ground. Yeah. There's a reason a lot of churches don't survive. And uh, there's a reason a lot of churches that used to be amazing or just not around anymore. For sure. It's crazy. Yep. Uh, the, the demonic spiritual warfare in this area is crazy, man. Yep. Um, the Prince of Persia surely reigns here. Yeah, for sure. And um, we're in the battle. I want to hear more about this, uh, with this detox that basically happened from <laughs> the fundamental Baptist. So yeah. first Sunday, did you decide like no suits or like- No, what, I did do it? suits. Yeah. Um, because the the group that was started there, even though they're all, it was it was a handful. By the way, I don't care if you still wear a suit. No, I don't wear a suit. I don't. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't. Wear a suit. The the group that the group that was there's was, there a handful of maybe twenty twenty four people. Yeah. Um, that were all not IFB Independent Fundamental Baptist people, but mm-hmm. were were led by leadership from that that were coming from that college, that were primarily that. So they did do hymns and they did dress uh, very conservative. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when we I love that, you know, all the hymns. Oh yeah. I know all the hymns, bro. I love it. dude. Yeah, I know. That's why my wife there and I say, we need to find a hymn church to go sing. Dude, I'm <laughs> telling, no, you, no, Nick, you should just set up a microphone like this yeah. and start recording the hymns off. Oh, bro. Oh, dude, let's go. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. That sound rough. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole point, dude. Know, we get men chanting these things again. Know, right? So rich. Oh dude. Yeah. So, so we did start, I would look, I would change it now, but I did what I didn't do then. And we did start, uh, with the suit and with hymns, um, with that group. And um, this is not how I would do it again, but I did it then. I would have sure. taken more time to structure that core team sure, and really bring some leadership and, and, and deprogram some ways of thinking. Sure. Um, but I was also going through that myself. Right. And so you're talking like getting up Sunday one, like, you know, in, in Burbank, you know, like really, really strong, like we do hymns only, King mm-hmm. James Bible. Mm-hmm. Um, to, you know, uh, you know, if you're saved here, you're only watching Fox news. I mean, like crazy, like things I'd say now that I'm looking like, man, why would I say nonsense? Sure. Because that helps nobody. Right. But it was after that, God, that year in November of 2012 to all through 2013, God was just changing me and my wife to where my wife was talking about why are we wearing dresses only? Mm. When the world, where's our conviction Mm. on this to where myself not being raised, not having a loyalty per se to a man Mm -hmm. or to an institution Mm -hmm. related to God, which frustrated a lot of people in my life because they're like, Nick's rebellious. Sure. But it was not my rebellion. It was just realizing that you're not God. Yes. And you're not Jesus. Yes. You're not going to be at my side when I stand in front of Christ. That's right. Um, um, and so I knew that, and that's when I started to slip into Cajon, uh, which is the big slippery slope to where taking my suit jacket off, like first few months, mm-hmm. uh, to where now like not wearing a tie my first like year mm-hmm. to now going to like, you know, I, I can remember buying our first, like, I think it was a casting crown CD with my wife. And mm-hmm. we we're like, we we're like, Whoa, this is crazy. So good. I huh? love Jesus. Yeah. Like, their lyrics are rich. Oh, man. bro, It was like nuts. Yeah. And I can still remember like, wow, I can't believe people actually love God. They're, 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 we were told their music is satanic mm. and it's calling in the devil. You know, they use this in Africa and the tribes mm. and all the different reasons of the of the beating sure, and the timing yeah, that yeah, they yeah. come up with. Sure. But we just kind of began saying, listen, we know we're going to burn some bridges. And we did. We, we lost some uh, dress attire, a pulpit attire, got rid of some suits and ties, and then brought in new music 
uh, we start with the cajon to now bringing in like a front line. They kind of bring in like a front that line. The cajon was a slippery slope. Slippery I love slope. <laughs> My wife was at this grand piano playing on Sundays. Yeah. Like, oh, like the first few years for us. Wow. Like the whole progression now where we are with keys. Incredible. To keys players. Incredible. You know, she's the more classical grand piano style. Yeah, she's I a, love it. She doesn't play no more. Yeah. Because um, it doesn't fit our style. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we went through that, that, that change that year and then eventually kind of came to some theological issues when it came to the King James Bible was a big one to move into like a, the MEV mm -hmm. to then now we use the ESV nice. um, to some theology things of, sure. of um, uh, other conversations to have of just some deeper theology things we were told of really beginning to question. And their thing is, is once you bring in the drum set, you're going to, you're going to change your Bible. Mm. And, and that's what they would say. And they would look at me now and good people. I have no hard feelings. They would sure. say, well, Nick, we knew Nick was going dangerous when he took off his tie. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a slippery slope. But the right. problem is, is that taking off the tie is a big thing. Cause you're beginning to question. Yeah. And that world is, is like, I remember being, what is, a, what is the premise of the tie? You know, I think they're just like the uh, Delta Airlines, American Airlines have a dressing attire sure. told to me for their employees. Yeah. We ought to, God ought to have some dress attire, some uh, expectations for his people. Why are we giving God sloppy seconds? Got it. And it was like totally avoiding how Jesus dressed. So there's no, 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 no text, no, no scripture and verse. Oh, not at all, bro. Okay. They may say they have it, but they twist them. Like yeah, yeah. remove not the ancient landmarks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You're like, is that what that's talking about? Right. You know, um, to everything, it's something about sure. um, every issue every issue is extra biblical from tattoos to your social things, to movies, to uh, dress, sure. women's dress. Yeah. Um, and so we started to question that stuff to all the way to where like year one, you know, they met with me, uh, some of the teachers there and one teacher in particular, who's a good guy, a good friend of mine. Um, hey, uh, we're worried about you. Mm -hmm. Like the terms are you, we're worried about you. We're worried the direction you're going. No question about your church is growing. You guys are, you guys have founded this thing and you guys are, you guys are developing and no question of how your soul's doing, how many people are saved, mm -hmm. all the things you think they should be excited about. Cause we're right. doing ministry, not in, not in Arizona or Texas. And we're down here on the front lines. Totally. Their world to me is like, why'd you go to the devil's front door? Right. And we're trying to pay bills and just trying to survive as a church plant. But it wasn't, it wasn't no to that help. Literally like, no, like from that from that world, nobody sent us a penny. Wow. Um, even, the, even the church up there. Wow. Um, and uh, to us individually, nothing came. Um, but it was like, we're concerned about your music. We're concerned about, we're concerned about uh, what you're wearing. Mm. And that, I got mad. And that was officially when I just told my wife, listen, I'm not going to conferences. They do an annual conferences there. Mm. I know I'm never gonna be t invited to come preach in College Chapel. Mm. That was a world I was, I was involved in. Um, it's hard. I, I was known in that world. It's hard. I learned how to preach in that world. We had, we could have, we could have blossomed in that world. If we want to use that word, my wife's pa dad is a independent fundamental Baptist pastor. Mm. He was raised at a big church in Idaho. So that world was a lot of like preacher boys and young preacher boys that sure. we can, that we can indoctrinate. Sure. Like they're, that we're going to, we're going to upraise them. And there are certain churches we have, you can take leadership in. Sure. But that was, that was, that was hard to be rejected. No doubt it was of, and, and then having to question, am I doing something wrong? I mean, I just, I'm still reading the Bible. I still love God's word. Right. Uh, I know I'm not wearing a tie, but I'm still preaching the gospel. Right. Um, and beginning to like, I know that we're not singing your hymn, but like these, these other people like Phil Wickham, he like loves Jesus and totally. he sings and like, why, what's wrong with that? Um, and really taught us in those first few years to really be, to really know God's calling though. And I remember one of the, one of the teachers there at that college, still there, just told me, Nick, you're going to need to know you're called. Cause that's going to be the only thing that's going to keep you there when you feel like quitting. Mm. And he may have told tons of people that, but that really stuck, stuck with me because it burned in me right now. It's branded in me. Uh, that calling is huge and marry, right? You got to marry, right? Cause your wife's there too. Mm. And it's not just you're by yourself and, and you, and, and basic things they taught me stuck with me and they're in that time of being disowned and literally being rejected of not invited here. You're on the slippery slope. You're not us anymore. Um, to where that we were just on our own from like very early 2013 mm -hmm. to all the way to where pretty much I met you. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're talking six, seven years of the hardest years of our life mm -hmm. of getting something established, getting something planted to be in mobile, to get in a building, to being a 27 year old, to like trying to make this thing with like no outside numbers to call or daddies to call or, wow. or uh, networks or denominations or mega churches. Like I didn't know that world and I, I learned about it now, Wow! but that was not it. And so our, we, we went through some struggles I personally, myself with my soul, my spirit, um, mm. my wife solid. Um, but yeah, just, it was, it was hard, dude. Yeah. It, was, it was the hardest time of our life and just kind of, 
she's blackballed. And, and, and unfortunately that's, you can get bitter and that's the, you know, we hear so much about deconstruction and bitterness in the move, in the faith and you can get bitter or else you could just know that, Hey, don't let these people brand who Jesus is Yes, because they're not Jesus. That's right. They're humans. Yeah. You know, and God is still good. His work can still be trusted. Um, we're not, we're not in this thing because of a man. That's right. You know, we're in this thing because God showed us, told us yes. to be here. Yeah. And that's, you know, not trying to preach or go on a rabbit trail, but that's kind of where we arrived at, yeah. which has helped us make it through a lot through COVID, through building transitions, through raising funds to, yes. to now get preparing to start another church to mm. like, you know, trying to, it, it's helped, it shaped us. Mm-hmm. So. No, Nick, dude, Nick, you, uh, I got to honor you in that, man. You're a champion for like just pushing through and like doing that. Cause it's like. Yeah, it is not, you, you, you give up everything. You sell your house, you take your, you drag your kids across the country. You do all this stuff. You start digging the hard ground here that nobody will dig. Yeah. And everybody's got a, an opinion. Yeah. Everybody yells at you from the outside. Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Why aren't you? It's like, why don't you come in here? The water's great, man. Yeah. Come and feel what it feels like out here. Yeah. Why don't you come and get the emails? Come talk to the people, come and deal with all the stuff, you know? Yeah. And, um, by the grace of God, you just kept pushing through, you know, despite all of the blackball or, you know, all of the cutting off of and, and the, the alienating and the feeling alone. And, um, that stuff is real. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, especially as a pastor, you already feel alone to some degree. It's, it's very difficult. Ministry yeah. is a weird, it's a weird profession, a weird occupation. It's a weird calling in that, yeah. um, you already feel alone a lot of the time because um, I think you have so many people around you, but there aren't a lot of people who fully understand what you're working through. Yeah. And so it's kind of you and your wife trying to navigate a lot and you're trying to glean from the brothers around you, the people that you have. But yeah, again, for your tribe, you know, to cut you off and say, sorry, dude, you're on your own. It's like, man, it's messed up. And, but I'm, I want to honor you and like speaking of that and just say like, you're a champion for doing that because, um, this is this is a massive issue in the church in that we have this tribalism that goes on and it's not until you get outside the tribe yeah you see how big the body of Christ is yeah and you're like oh my gosh like God Jesus loves all these people all yeah. these people are his sons and daughters they don't worship like me they don't look like me they don't act like me they love the Word of God they're led by the Holy Spirit um, who cares about all this other stuff yeah. you know God is not concerned. God does not look on a man yeah. the way that people do. God looks at the heart. Yeah. It is not about the letter of the law. It's never been. It's about the spirit of the law. What does it say? What does it mean? What is he getting at? And we love to nail down this letter of the law and say, no, it it says, and this is exactly what it is. And it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> Jesus overturned that over and over and over again. He's like, did the Sabbath really say that? Yeah. You mean my guys can't pick some grain because they're getting a little snack for some food because it's on the Sabbath? Yeah. Yeah, because it said they can't work. And it's like, dude, you guys missed it the whole time. Yeah. And we have tribes, entire denominations doing this stuff. Yeah. Over and over and over again. And I love anytime I get into a tribe, well, I grew up in my own tribe and we have our own problems yeah. and, uh, and I love my tribe, Calvary Chapel. Um, but it is, it is a lot of the same stuff going on. We have this tribalism, anybody who's not like us and doesn't hold to what we hold to is the enemy. Yeah. And, um, if you start to step out of line, um, with them, the same, you know, same thing, they're going to start to call you out or start to turn and, you know, lift an eyebrow and be like, what is he doing over there? Yeah. And man, I just love um, just blowing open the whole thing. Yeah. You know what? I'm not going to walk in the fear of man. Yeah. The fear of man is a snare. Yeah. Proverbs tells us it's a trap. Um, but I'm going to walk in the fear of the Lord for then I have refuge, then I am safe. Yeah. Uh, I got to fear what God thinks and not what man thinks. And I love demanding scripture and verse, please. Yeah. Scripture and verse, please. Yeah. I want text. Yeah. Yeah. There's a uh, yeah. sermon that one of my mentors gives. Uh, in the book of Genesis, um, the title of the sermon is, he didn't say that. (laughs) And he just shouts like 10 times in the sermon, he didn't say that. God did not say suit and tie. Yeah, yeah. God did not say King James only. God did not say these things. Yeah. Yet we have a way of nailing down these things and saying, you know, you're either a part of our tribe or you're not. When actually we are part of the body of Christ, the great tribe. Um, and when we get to heaven, we'll all be shocked. Yeah. Uh, who's there? Yeah. We'll be shocked who's not there. Yep. 
and we'd be most shocked that we are there. Yeah. That we made it. Yeah. That we're actually there. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. Dude, so you've been here plowing the ground for 12 years, Los Angeles. Yeah. And uh, you guys have four kids. We do, four daughters. So your wife is a sinking trooper, man. She is, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, uh, shout out to wife. What's her name? Rachel. Rachel. Yeah. Shout out to Rachel. Um, I know my wife. Um, she's my greatest supporter, my greatest counselor, my greatest confidant. Yeah. And uh, she's pushed me to do things I thought I was not capable of doing. Yeah. And uh, she's been there all this time. Yep. Through all the crazy, all yeah. the ups and downs. And she'll be there when everyone else leaves. That's right. Right. Yep. And so uh, your 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 wife has been there. Yeah. And uh, you guys are raising four kids in LA. Yep. Wow. And are you guys homeschooling the kids? No. We did. So we started out too early on a little bit. Yeah. And um, we felt like... For us, um, for a lot of different reasons, we started out doing it. Um, another story, another time. But we felt like for us, God wanted us to really get involved in our schools. Wow. In, this, in, in our city, in mm -hmm. Burbank. Mm -hmm. And um, has a great school system. has a great school system. Yeah. And I know the cautions people are going to say of, we don't use your, your kids aren't ready to evangelize. And that's not what we're doing. Sure. We understand that. We've read those books. We, yeah. We've been told that. Right. Um, but we did feel like, okay, we have, we have built a strong foundation. We are building a strong foundation at home. The school district was not as bad as everyone is saying it is. Got it. And the teachers are not as evil as everyone is saying they are. Yeah. And they well, have especially to... Burbank. Yeah, exactly. Burbank, Burbank's a city unto its own. It's got yeah. its own fire department. It does department. everything. It's own incorporated city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's going to be the people that say, well, this guy doesn't know yet. And I get that. And they say about everything. But the reality is, is we felt like that's what God wanted us yeah, to do. Yeah, for the season, this is what you guys are doing. Uh, so we put them in school. So they're all in school. We have two in middle school. Awesome. Go to uh, a middle school there in Burbank. We have two in elementary school. Okay. And so our oldest is eighth grade. Starts high school here. She's registered to high school. Got it. High school next year. Awesome. She'll go to Burroughs High School. And then our uh, we have a sixth grader. And then we have a a uh, third grader and a second grader. And they're in the elementary school. And so, yeah, they're involved in the schools. And we've been able to see a lot of people, teachers come and, and people, um, coaches come to church and learn about the word and um learn about Christ and some give their lives to Christ and seeing wow. God transform, not just the church people in that city, mm. but actually having a culture of invitation Yes, where we're actually seeing the city come and hear of, of the gospel. That's awesome. So, yeah. What is, um, so what's the vision? I mean, I, I thought I heard a uh, some subtle, like you guys are going to plant another church mm -hmm. or you're, you're, you're getting after it. Yeah, we are. Yeah. We have a guy right now that is, uh, has done student ministry for us for, Five or six years. Awesome. And um, he is going to be, um, he's, he's, he's kind of in residency right now. And he is going to, we're going to plant him um, here um, in the coming months. And so we're going to be up in, we're looking at the Woodland Hills area. Awesome. So yeah, this direction. Yeah. So uh, we have him and a, a couple other, another pastor that's going to jump on board with it. Uh, to be on the the um, like the spiritual formation side of people, discipleship and community mm -hmm, life, mm -hmm. and a group of people that'll be going with him from us. And so, yeah, we're we're kind of all kind of in the planning stage now, um, but it's gonna definitely happen. It's what we've been gearing up for. That's exciting. Yeah, is uh, is it going to be called City Light? It is. So we're gonna it's gonna be multi congregational. Mm -hmm. So people use the word satellite. But we're not doing satellite. Uh, we're like I'm on a camera. I don't sure. want to see myself on a camera. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's gonna be a, their own lead pastor, their own plurality of elders. Yep. And it's going to be a team, though, of us that work together, awesome. um, guiding the congregation at large. So yes. it'll be our second congregation. Like a family of churches. Family of churches. Yeah. And so that'll be it. And we'll see how that goes. And then we'll see what God does in the time in the future. That's know? exciting. So if someone is listening to this a year from now. Yeah. And they hear of a wood, they're in Woodland Hills. Woodland Hills, yep. So this would be, uh, they just look up uh, wood, City Light, City Light Woodland yep. Hills, yep. and they'll probably find the church. Probably. Awesome. Yeah. Or they can obviously connect with you guys. Yeah. And uh, this is exciting. It is. Um, this is 12 years coming. Yeah. So um, are you guys raising support from the inside? Are you sending people with them? How are you, yep. guys, how are you guys holding it out? Yep. On both of those, yes. So we'll be sending people with them and then him building core teams too with people that want to jump in on it. Mm -hmm. But the people from City Light, mainly directors and leadership, will be jumping on that. Um, two pa he'll be the lead pastor of another pastor jumping in. So they'll have their two on their pastoral team. Mm -hmm. uh, we have three at our, at our congregation in Burbank pastors. And so together we'll kind of guide the congregation, but then people will be jumping on directors and then core team people can jump on as well. And then fundraising will come primarily from churches and individual donors that want to help commit for the time being. Awesome. And then we ourselves though, we paying for 
more than likely facilities and, and more than that too. Yeah. Um, for us here, for our own people in Burbank, we'll be owning this project. Awesome. You know, this, this church plant. Thing. Wow. Incredible. And, um, how many, you've been in LA for again, a decade here. Yeah. How many churches do you think we need in LA? Oh man, a lot. I've, I've seen, I mean, honestly, man, um, we keep our head down, but it is discouraging how many churches have closed. And I know you've probably know more than I do, but it has just been yeah. unbelievable of guys that you feel. And it, I got to protect myself not being jaded because sure. in myself, I just want to be like, oh, how long is he going to last? And you learn not to smile at the sparkly penny because you're like, okay, it's cool. But really that's one Sunday is not going to grow. It's like building a house, starting with a foundation and one little panel at a time. And it's longevity. And it's, it's not, it's LA sexy. It's people use this place. We, yes. we live in a culture of people come to our city and they want to try to make it in the industry and then go back to Texas, totally. or go back to Arizona or go back to where they can afford a house, Yes, you know, but, and it's expensive here, but, um, you know, the need here is huge and yes. the need of God's calling on them though. They got to realize they're not going to live in the biggest house. Right. They're going to be paying an astronomical amount of money where they're going to look at their friend you know, I was raised in Vegas. I've done a lot of stuff in Arizona and Colorado, other Western parts of the country you can move to and get a bigger, even outside of LA of people that still call themselves Southern California, desert places here. Sure. Where you can buy bigger houses. Sure. And you're going to have to be okay though, to live like the people here Yeah. and have, you know, for us, we have six of us in a two bedroom house, yep. we have four daughters on bunk beds in one wow. room and people, and it, it's hard when you look at friends that you realize that, that not pridefully, but you realize like, I could do what they do. Sure. And they make, they, they, they're living so much more comfortably and your wife's got to be okay with it. Right. And the school system and the type of people. It's a calling. It's a big time. And it's such a unique area that the situation's huge because churches keep closing their doors mm -hmm. or else they're there and they're dead. They're, they're renting their space out to 15 other people mm -hmm. and that's how they're paying their bills. Yeah. Um, and so the vision's huge. I mean, I want to, I, I, me and my wife, our dream is to be bar buried at Forest Lawn mm -hmm. and live here until we die and mm -hmm. figure out how long we do this thing mm -hmm. and realize that we're not the savior of this place, but mm -hmm. you know what? Well, we want to give our lives and do what we can. Mm -hmm. And we're praying that God raises up men and women that feel called on this thing with us. Yes. So. Yes. No, you're right. A lot of churches closed. A lot of churches didn't make it. And a lot of guys we thought would totally make it um, somehow did not make it. And uh, the pandemic had a way of just like sweeping the yeah. city. And um, yeah, if you're watching on the news and wondering what was happening in LA during the pandemic, what you saw is exactly what was happening <laughs> in LA. And yeah. we were in it and um, it was hard, you know, because it, it did, it gutted, it gutted our church. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, we went through it and um, a lot of people went home. A lot of people went back to other states. A lot of people left because of political reasons, because of, um, vaccine reasons because yeah. of uh covid regulation reasons because of race racial reasons mm -hmm. black lives matter yeah um the whole move there was a lot of there you almost could not win you were trying to please yeah people you're trying to trying to find the balance and it's just you just could there was no balance yeah you're, you're not going to please anybody and we lost a lot of people we got kicked out of our location um we were online for eight months huh. And then uh, I went to, I just kept calling yeah. to see, w you know, who would let us meet all the parks in the area, the beaches. I'm like calling synagogues. Like I'm just trying to figure out where we can meet. So eventually American Jewish University, AJU yeah. over in Bel Air off 405, um, right there in Mulholland. Mm -hmm. um, they let us meet on the grass. Oh, wow. So we met on the grass for five months Wow. on the basketball court in the grass <laughs> and uh, at this Jewish university. And, um, yeah, we did that for five months and praise God, the day that bridges, our school opened the doors was Easter Sunday, wow. 2021. Wow. So we are back in for Easter Sunday. Yeah. And of course it was magical. You know, we were, we were so stoked, you know, to get back in. Yeah. But I felt like it has been a, um, we call it legacy 2.0. Yeah. It's a reset, man. <laughs> yeah, it's like, sure. you know, it's like oh, yeah. we, we had to start all over. And um, doesn't it feel like um, people are coming back to church right now? It does. Finally in LA, like mm -hmm. everybody's yeah. they're hungry for the truth. Yeah. They're hungry for somebody to speak into the clarity of this spiritual climate and the chaos that's going on in our world. And um, I feel like people are just coming back to church finally. Like it's like, um, I don't know. The, our first five years of legacy was a, was a strong run. It was a lot of fun. Pandemic gutted us. And then we felt like we had to start all over. Yeah. And then... It's, I just felt like it's taken probably until just the end of this last year, fall of this last year, we're just like, 
I don't know. Like, I just feel like LA is ready to come back to church or something. Yeah. Yep. I agree. Yeah, no, it was a hard time. We were, we were, we were, hit, we opened our building in 2017, okay. November of 2017. And that was a lot of just mobility and banquet that, rooms and transition and fundraising. I mean, that, you're was, talking, that was two years of construction, right? Two, two and a half years of construction. Wow. Um, and people, you know, a lot of money being raised, a lot of pipe and drape, a lot mm-hmm. of temporary location, mm-hmm. a lot of my, my garage was our storage unit for mm-hmm. four years mm-hmm. for our, our Sunday stuff. I mean, um, it was just insanity. Things happen. And, um, but we opened our building in 2017 in the fall. And then we, uh, 2018, we had some good growth. 2019, we had some weird stuff happen with some staff. Um, and then we were like, it is like, okay, we're here. I'm, I'm coming. I mean, the last six months of our building project, my wife had it taken on. We had to get rid of our contractor because we mm. didn't have money. Mm. So like we painted that whole building. Mm. Um, every bit of it. You guys painted it. Me and my wife painted the whole building. Dude, yeah. I love it. <laughs> yeah, bro. It was Beast nuts. mode. I mean, we slept there over oh, and over. Dude, you're awesome. Yeah, Shout was, out to your wife. No, it, was insane. it was insane. You guys are awesome. Yeah. I mean, every little thing, the bathroom stalls, the toilet installation, the whole finishing touches, we, we didn't have the money. It was like offering to offering each Sunday and we got to build this thing. And then we opened that thing. 2018, some good year, 2019, some, uh, okay year, but some staff stuff. Um, and then 2020, the COVID, we had three services COVID hit. I remember the Sunday, first Sunday, second Sunday of March, whatever it was. Like, hey, this thing's real. I'm like, no way it's real. It's America. And I was like, no, it's real. I'm like, okay. Uh, let's talk on the camera. And so we closed down for four or five months. Mm-hmm. Um, but the summer of 2020, we did go against different things they said. And we mm-hmm. gathered again for one service. Our church was gutted. People mm-hmm. moved away. Mm-hmm. Um, no doubt. But my thing was, is listen, if you can fly in an airplane and go to Disney World, then you totally. come to church, bro. Oh, yeah. I'll say that. I'd be like, we're not doing live stream. Oh, dude, the seating on the plane is closer oh, than the seating at church. It's horrible. And that was like common. And, and I just wasn't going to deal with it. I was like, let's just be smart here. This is not sure. like the right side. Totally. Or I'm a scientist. I know I'm not. We're not here to hurt anybody. Yeah, we're going to gather if you want to come. And so for a few months, we did do this live stream people wanted to eventually we shut that down said we noticed you're watching live stream but you're flying on planes so come to church mm-hmm. so we got health department was in front of our building bro for, for months right are you tickets. kidding me i mean i remember one sunday bro in the summer of 2020 summer late summer 2020 health department was in front of our building and and then one of our pastors came up and said hey nick you got to prolong this dismissal we got three health guys out front and so i'm like hey guys uh, i'm not gonna lie to you we have the health department it was like we we're underground church in china dude wow and like giving people tickets as they're leaving Get and like out of here and like oh bro it's nuts and that went on for months of health department and people getting mad at us in the city, but we met and then God was good. Finally, I think everyone started to smell. Okay. Why aren't we meeting? We're not saying it wasn't real. We just started to realize, okay, there's some weird stuff going on. We need to meet. Mm-hmm. And then, um, yeah, one service to two service. Now last Sunday, we just started our third service again. Praise and God, are returning. Yeah, last Sunday, so yeah, it was crazy. So people are returning, Yes, um, but it's been a trying, I mean, we did build the church again. People moved away, <sighs> left. And they're gone. And like, you know, um, the city lights all over the globe uh, because people just moved. And it's like, yeah, the virus, money, housing, racial stuff. Because we opened, they thought we were one political side than the other. Um, and they just automatically labeled me because I'm white. And, you know, and because we opened. And all those things were real stuff, dude. And yeah, enough to kill you, man. Enough to make you want to run away. Yes. And, uh, yeah, I mean, what, what, what's the theme, what's the common denominator that's really held you through all of this, you know, like when you reflect Mm -hmm. back on just what was the Lord teaching, you know, what, what, I don't know, you know, even when you reflect on a, the next church planner, you know, like, what do you tell them, you know, like what, what is the thing that holds you you through all these seasons? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think, I mean, this is God's thing. I'm a conduit. Mm. It's not my thing. Yes. Um, I'm not expecting one big donor to pay my bit, pay my check. Mm. Um, I don't care. I'll sleep on a corner. Mm. My family did live in RV for a year with four kids. Mm. Um, I don't care. I, I'm not here because of your money. I'm not here because you want to pull your, be on the board or do I need, this is God's thing mm. and we are God's servant and there's no, I don't deserve anything. Lose that title, that feeling of entitlement, which is kills ministry leaders. Mm. Um, this is God's thing. And so I think, I think just understand who this belongs to and COVID is not going <laughs> to throw God off. Um, and his word will not come back void. And Amen. I believe it. And that's the hell to do it, man. No point. I, I, like, I'm not trying to open church and do church because I want to prove a point to you. Mm. I, you're not that big that I want to prove a point to you. Like, mm. I'm not saying that disrespectfully, but mm. that was a lot of people thinking we're trying to mm. prove a point. I was like, no, this is God's thing. Mm-hmm. You know, leave God's thing alone, mm-hmm. you know? 
No, amen. Yeah, it's, it is, the Lord will accomplish his work. I was even saying this at men's study the other night. I was like, you know, if I didn't come here to plant the church, yeah. God would have found somebody else. Sure, yeah, yeah. There would have been somebody else here yeah, to plant yeah. the church. Yeah. He doesn't need me. Yeah. He can use whoever he wants. Yeah. He can, he can knight whoever he wants, whenever he wants. I'm, I'm a guy just like you. Yeah. For some reason with these gifties, I don't, I don't know why I got these giftings, but I yeah. don't know why, yeah. you know, but I, I now have to steward them and, but it is God's thing. Yep. And I think Bono said that like, um, you too, <laughs> he said, um, I want to figure out what God's doing and I want to get on board with what he's doing. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm, this isn't about what I'm doing and I hope God gets on board with what I'm doing. This is about what God is doing. I want to figure out what he's up to in the city Yeah. and I want to get on board with that. And um, I think it's also met too, Nick, with, I don't know, I can see, again, this is the longest conversation we've ever had, but I can see, again, a, a determination, almost like a focus, a drive, you know, almost like a stubbornness to yeah. to bring God glory mm -hmm. and to do his work. Um, I don't know if you feel this way, but, you know, a lot of people ask me like, oh, did you dream about becoming a pastor? You know, were you going to be, you know, when you were young? I'm like, no, <laughs> like I was, I was building houses, we're doing construction and that was my plan. I was just going to develop. We buy lots and develop houses. And um, that's what I was thinking I was going to do in my early 20s. And I got roped into the youth ministry and I got sucked in. Yeah. I love the kids. Yeah. And, you know, before you know it, I realized people are listening to me teach. And then they let me teach on the pulpit. And then, you know, you get raised up and all that starts to happen. And the train just takes off and you're on this train. But um, yeah, you know, like I didn't grow up like dreaming of this calling like God had that. But it's almost like once you step into the calling and once you see that God has identified gifts, talents, and abilities in you, um, it's almost necessary for you to carry them out. Like, do you, do you feel that burden upon you? Almost like um, at the end of time, when you stand before the Lord, that he'll require something of you. Like he mm -hmm. has, you know what I mean? You, yeah, you, yeah, you speak about, thing. you speak about this in such spiritual terms. Yeah. Um, instead of real practical, tangible terms on the earth, you speak of it. Um, almost as if, I don't know if you feel this, almost as if there is like a burden um, in eternity in which God has uh, called you to do this. You have mm -hmm. a mission to do, you're going to carry out his work. Yeah. Yeah, I think so for sure. I mean, that that judgment seat of Christ, the cross, the blood of Christ, his grace, you know, we're teaching through Philemon right now where mm -hmm. Paul writes, he's like, you know, I'm, I'm not telling you this out of compulsion, but for the love's sake. And like, you'll do crazy things because you love something, mm. you know? I mean, you'll scream your head off at a Dodger game. Yeah. <laughs> or like, I'll cheer for do girls softball because my girls love softball. Yeah. You know, I mean, love crazy does crazy things. But totally. when you, I think that love captivates you. You realize like, dude, like, I don't, I don't think I'm better than any other calling out there, but I'm so thankful that I get to use my voice and my oxygen in my lungs and blood in my blood vessels and every ounce of energy I have, you know, because yeah, he's worthy. His glory is worthy, mm. you know. Maybe any words to anybody uh, thinking about planting a church in LA? Uh, maybe there's some young guys who yeah. are uh, praying about, thinking about, uh, maybe they're hearing this five years from now. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, they're hearing from, we're, we're a decade in. Yeah, uh, yeah. It'll be 10 years for, uh, awesome. for a legacy this year, and uh, which we're stoked about. But yeah, I don't know any, any words, you know, um, for maybe young guys or people who are thinking about planting, especially you're in this season yeah, of yeah. planting another church. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think if you're leaning into it, I would go. Um, it's going to be the hardest thing you've ever done in your life. There's much easier places to plant a church and you're still going to get glory from a lot of networks because starting a church anywhere is hard. And I don't think we're better than anyone to start a church. Um, but you're going to still get accepted. You're still going to be called a church planner. You're still going to, but if you come here, you better understand where you're coming and you better know this is not a walk in the park. This is a post-Christian community. People aren't moving to LA to find a church. Um, great people, but they're not moving here for that reason. Um, they're, mo they're moving to Arizona. They're moving to outside of Southern California to some desert areas. We see that a lot with our people, whether it's Riverside area or North of Lancaster and that Valley, but they're not moving to where we are. Mm. And the house is the cost of living. Your wife better understand it because mm. um, she's, you know, you're going to be looking at a million plus at least for a two bedroom house. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, it's, you, you know, it's, you have a lot of passion, especially me when I moved here, I was 27 years old. I could do, God's going to 
you know, boldness, holy boldness. Mm -hmm. But when your pocketbooks are zero, that holy boldness is tested, mm. you know, and that's going to happen. Mm. And so you better just know God's called you. But if you will, if you, if you want to go, if you want to hear people talk about faith and slaying giants, you know, or you want to be a part, you want to do it because you can hear about it. Mm. You can read biographies, but mm. there's guys that are here doing it. Mm. Guys like yourself, um, that God is, you're doing it. Mm. You're here. You're seeing those miracles. Mm -hmm. You're not reading about them. And I'm going to go pick up a biography to read about it, even though I will read those. Right. But dude, this is, this is front lines, you know? So if you're, if you're stepping into it, come, you know, we'll be here. Hopefully God willing. Yes. But, God willing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Come join, come jump in the water, man. It's yeah. nice. It's yeah. real nice. Real nice. <laughs> <It's> real nice. <laughs> <laughs> the Dodgers are great. Yeah. <laughs> You know what? Well, let's let's talk about some of the beautiful thing in the city. I mean, we got some of the best food in town. Yeah, we got. For sure. I mean, best food in the world. Oh heck yeah! All the cuisines. You know, we got great beaches. Um, you know, all the houses are different. You know, you definitely have all the culture, and there's endless things to do here, no doubt. Yeah. But yeah, um, you know, and it's it's that's all the fun. But Nick, you said it right. We are on the front lines spiritually. If you want to fight, if you just want to run out to the front lines and just start swinging a sword, like just, just show up here. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's the, the emails I got, I got emailed last, the last two weeks I've gotten yeah. emails <laughs> and the emails that you get from people yeah. visiting the church and people showing up and it's just, it's just never going to stop. It's never going to end. Yeah. And the attacks will never stop and will never end. Yeah. Um, you almost step in knowing that, um, you step onto the front lines, especially trying to be a leader on the front lines. Mm -hmm. um, the crosshairs are lined up on you, the bullseyes on you. And so the enemy's going to come and try to attack you, attack your wife, attack your kids. Yeah. And to get at your center, uh, God is able, God's stronger than all of those things. Yeah. And uh, he fights for us, praise God. But uh, yeah, it's not without casualties. Yeah. You can go, you know, you can go to a place with no casualties. Yep. And so, and then all you guys uh, out there who throw grenades at us, who are in the church, uh, who are not in LA, please yeah. don't do that. Yeah, for real. Uh, please, we got enough grenades coming at us already. Yeah. Like, how about you come in here and yeah. throw a grenade at the enemy with us? Yep. Uh, yep. That'd be great. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Nick, dude, uh, this has been great. You, um, we're throwing grenades together yeah. at the enemy. Yeah. And uh, I appreciate you plowing this ground and staying faithful, you know, over all these years. Um, you're an example to me, even just hearing your story mm -hmm. and uh, persevering through, grabbing onto the Lord, clinging to him. And uh, for your wife and your four kids, yeah, uh, sticking it out in Los Angeles and keep doing this work. Uh, it's amazing, man. Yeah. And uh, I'm just, I don't know, just, just blessed by your story, blessed by what God's doing and hoping and believing he has much more to do. Uh, how can people find you? I, I say we go get some lunch. What do you say? Sounds good, man. Okay. Yeah. How can people find you? Yeah. You can go to citylightla.church. Um, social media, Instagram, citylightla.church, Instagram, Facebook, website. And they can online. find you, Nick Reed online if mm -hmm. they, they Nick want Reed to. Nick Reed LA. Yeah. Nick Reed LA, yep. Nick, Nick Reed LA. Yep. And, Instagram. Uh, dude, I'm thankful for you and uh, believing that God has much more to do in our city. Um, and maybe we'll do some stuff together. Sounds awesome. It'll be fun. I look forward to it. Let's get some lunch. That's it. Sounds good, bro.